Hey guys, how's it going? I thought I'd tackle another video today. And that is, um, why fuel and moose became extinct. I think there's a number of different reasons. Um, you know, it's helpful to understand the environment that they were released into, the spread that they had, and then the competition for resources that they ended up having. Now, a bit of context for those of you who might not have seen the previous video. There were two releases of moose in New Zealand in uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, the first was on the west coast. Uh, moose became extinct very rapidly. There is no evidence that they bred whatsoever. Um, the second release happened in Bjornland in 1910. Um, there is clear evidence that moose bred and a small herd formed. Um, and depending on who you are, somewhere between 1950 and the modern day, uh, moose either became extremely rare or went extinct. Um, for purposes of uh, this video, we'll refer to their extinction um, as happening um, in the 1950s. I myself don't believe that, but um, the official record has them as that, as having gone extinct during that period of time. And we will refer to that because the standard of proof is so high for proving that moose uh, do exist in few of them. Now, um, standard is something that we've talked about in the previous moose video and I think it probably also deserves its own video because it relates very clearly to another a uh, number of other endangered species uh, or potentially extinct species like the South Island Kokako um, you know the the genuinely the general but we, for, for what we'll talk about today the generally accepted uh, level of proof required to allow us to believe that the species still exists today has not been met by the moose and for several other species most notably the South Island Kogako it has not been met despite the fact that there is almost certainly an, a population on, uh, ongoing and living in New Zealand. So with that in mind let's discuss why this extinction happened. Now, it's helpful to remember that when moose were released into Fiordland, there was no heavily populated area in Fiordland that had, uh, sorry, there was no area in Fiordland that had any real population of deer, of any other species living there. Red deer had been released all over New Zealand at that stage, and there were without a doubt red deer in Fiordland but they had not settled in numbers yet. So, moose had this vast environment that they were released into, hundreds of square, you know, hundreds of kilometers in length and bread that was almost exclusively theirs. Now, it was an environment that was vastly different to the Northern Hemisphere environment that they were used to. And this, without a doubt, would have prevented, presented challenges. Uh, over all the sightings of moose that happened from there until the modern era, I believe there's only one or two sightings that reference a female moose with twin calves, which is really important because it's a very common feature in northern hemisphere populations. But it is only a feature of healthy populations, which suggests that the nutrition or the in environmental food available to moose was limited or insufficient for them to gain the condition necessary to be producing twins, which suggests a nutritional component was missing from their diet in the Southern Hemisphere that would have allowed them to thrive here. So from the get-go, they had challenges with breeding. Now, it didn't mean that moose couldn't live healthy lives here. There are There is one moose that was released in 1910, broke its leg on the day of release, and it was shot 20 years later, which is kind of the extreme end of a moose's lifespan. The same individual was shot 20 years later with a damaged leg. So, well, with, you know, with a damaged leg in the same spot. Um, so... This is, it doesn't mean the moose couldn't 
live here comfortably, but the extreme end of nutrition does, the extreme end of health needed to really produce twins, which again, would un, would highlight a healthy population doesn't seem to have been there. So, so there was definitely a nutritional component. I would argue, and actually this is Ken Tustin, who is a really expert on the uh, topics theory as well, that actually being released into an environment with, you know, there's nothing, comparatively nothing, and since no big game animals in the immediate area, I mean, the moose dispersed widely. And the first 30, or the first 20 years after their release, a moose turned up in Tua Tapri in Southland, which I think is somewhere in the ballpark of 100 to 150 kilometers away from their release area. There's reports of another one turning up in north of Milford Sound, and, and like credible reports where, you know, like multiple people claimed it to have seen it. Certainly, there's three or four sightings from this period of time from northern Fiordland, and quite a few from the eastern side of Fiordland, you know, Wilmot Pass, down towards Tianau, um, all areas that would never again have any moose sightings. And, and these are credible enough that, especially the Tua Tapri one, there's really limited doubt that this happened. You know, like there's almost certainly a moose made it from Fiordland to Tua Tapri. And a key component of this widespread dispersal was probably the lack of any other competition with red deer in their immediate environment. And it's interesting because what seems to have happened is moose just seem to have shot to the four winds. And they probably got so far away from each other that actually limited breeding happened. Now you had this big population boom, everyone goes in their separate directions, they get too far away from any other moose, and then these individuals get shot or die out, or you know they, 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 they get too far to breed. And then the population contracts back. And a key reason it starts contracting back is competition with red deer and wapiti. You know, you have wapiti or elk in northern Fiordland who really start taking off around this time. So northern Fiordland, most stop really pushing into that area because there's just too much competition for resources. Elk are big animals. And so moose are competing with another big animal to their immediate north. You've also got a spine of mountains that runs through um, central Fiordland, which are very hard to get over. And it does seem the moose tended to only be able to get over the Wilmot Pass, which leads into Doubtful Sound, and a few other areas. Given this, the push of red deer over those mountains in the 30s, 40s, and 50s really contracts them back to the area of Dusky and Doubtful Sound where they were released. And so this natural contraction back into this range then forces them to not only stay there, but compete directly with red deer as red deer invade this area. And it seems likely that moose did thrive, at least initially, up until the late 40s and early 50s when red deer really took over this area. And there's actually some evidence to suggest this as well from other species. Axis deer were released into... Uh, 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 the same area at the same time, and the last sighting of an axis stag is in 1952. After this point, uh, point in time, they were probably outcompeted or inbred with red deer and disappeared. So, you, moose need a huge amount of food to survive, and red deer during this period of time reached plague proportions, particularly in the late 50s and early 60s. So much so that an entire industry jumped up of backcountry hunters, helicopters, uh, helicopter hunters, and um, you know, sort of the, the, the wider infrastructure around that to procure venison for the overseas markets. And this industry in the, in the 1950s and 60s mostly focused on backcountry hunting. And it didn't really make a dent but what they sort of what they saw was that the Fiordland was thick with red deer, 
And there's a number of reports, particularly from the 60s, of dead moose carcasses being found which had starved to death because the entire understory of the forest had been stripped bare and the only food available to, red, uh, to moose was that was in the trees that they could reach up higher than red deer to, which involved a lot of effort, energy, and they just simply weren't able to sustain themselves. What is fascinating is in the mid to late 60s, when the red deer population reaches its zenith, that is when moose sightings plummet. Between 1968 and 1978, we go from dozens of moose sightings to next to none. And then in the late 70s, helicopter hunting comes in, and at scale, deer are eradicated from right across New Zealand. And this eradication was so severe that it is only today that red deer are starting to bounce back. So suddenly in the late 80s, you had, or sorry, in the early 80s, for the first time in 30 years, Fiordland has space to breathe. Red deer are gone again. What do you probably have left? If there are moose in Fiordland at that stage, which is good evidence to suggest there were, suddenly they scatter to the four winds again. They have the exact same problem they had when they were first released. There's nothing keeping them in one area. See, moose probably need enough competition with red deer to keep them in one area. You know, that area is probably marginally more favorable than other areas but not so much competition that they get out competed and, and starved to death. And suddenly they're in the exact same position again. <clears throat> they're almost extinct, but they scatter to the four winds. Probably some limited breeding happened, enough to keep a few individuals around till the modern era. <coughs> but if there are moose left in Fiordland, they are probably on the verge of extinction. Why? Because red deer populations have bounced back. And now moose if they do still exist, probably being forced back into the same constricted area, but this time there's so few of them, they're very likely to be outcompeted, you know, So I think there's probably most still in Fjordland. That's my view at least. I know it's not a universal view, but they face such incredible competition from deer that if they're not extinct, they will be in you know, the next 15 or 20 years. I do think there is an inbreeding component as well, but that's something we can tackle on another video. It's just my thoughts. Um, I think it's an interesting topic. I'd like to really thank Ken Tustin, who wrote a fantastic series of books on this topic. And a lot of the ideas I'm talking about are ones directly borrowed from him. Um, he is a fascinating human being and a fascinating uh, scientist. And I really cannot highly recommend uh, his work enough. Um, thanks very much. We'll tackle another topic soon.